Hello, uh, thanks for uh, tuning into this uh, talk um, uh, video about um, some area of specialism within family law that I'm particularly interested in that I've done some research around. My name is Simon Flax, I'm a lecturer at Westminster Law School and I'm going to talk to you about parental substance use and family justice. Parental substance use and addiction is quite a live public and policy issue. Um, it's very contentious, um, it's quite morally charged. You may have seen stories in newspapers about the problems of parental addiction and the effect it has on children. Uh, some of these stories are particularly uh, demonising of the parents concerned. In some jurisdictions around the world, it's even possible that a pregnant mother would be imprisoned. Um, if she uses drugs and alcohol, if there's evidence that she uses drugs and alcohol because she's imperiled her unborn child. Uh, that doesn't happen in many jurisdictions, but it's still the case in some. And even when pregnant mothers are not necessarily in prison, they may be subject to all sorts of coercive mechanisms because it's been discovered that they are using drugs or alcohol. Um, so it's quite a contentious area of, um, of public policy and, and also of law, and that's that's one of the reasons I'm really interested in it, and, and perhaps you might be interested as well. It's not a new issue um, for people to be concerned about, whether in uh, the policy realm or the legal sphere. Uh, but I do think that over the last 20 or 30 years, it's become much more of a kind of a live policy issue, if you like, um, and in, in, in this country at least. And part of that the reason for that is that there are a number of reports published in the early 2000s which identified the harms that children had experienced or were experiencing um, or could experience as a result of having parents who used drugs and alcohol. Uh, and these had quite a, a, a severe and, and considerable impact on public policy. So often in local authorities you will now find uh, hidden harm workers uh, who 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 are, who are employed specifically to kind of work out whether children are at risk as a result of parental drug and alcohol use and also how to resolve the problems that ensue. And um, uh, but most of the sort of the interest in this area has mostly been from non-legal fields, so the fields of social work, health policy and so on. Uh, there's much less interest, um, I think, and there has been much less interest in the impact of parental substance use and addiction in the family justice system. So why this matters for you as family lawyers uh, is that um, substance misuse is thought to be involved in up to a third of care applications. So in terms of public law, it's a very kind of common issue to come up in public law cases. If you speak to family law solicitors who are involved in child protection, they will often have a caseload that involves at least um, one or two, perhaps more uh, instances where there is some there, uh, there is some application by a local authority because there is an um, there is evidence of parental drug use or addiction. Uh, so it's 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 um, it's it's particularly. Um, important in that sense. It's also often cited in private law cases uh, and especially between parents whose relationship has broken down and who are where there is a dispute about child care and one of those parents or even both of those parents are accusing the other parent of excessive drug or alcohol use and that's quite common for family solicitors to or family barristers to encounter um, you know allegations of the, in, in that regard. So it's a really important issue uh, and yet uh, there, there hasn't really been a huge amount of research into it. There's been a lot of research in, into, into the family justice system generally in family courts and outcomes in family courts, but not so much in, into, um, I suppose the things that I'm interested in are, you know, what, what impact does uh, addiction have on parental capacity according to the courts? You know, what do they understand addiction to be? What do they understand drug use to be? And when does that drug use or alcohol use become problematic? Those are sorts of all of the interesting, uh, the, the, the questions that I was quite interested in in this respect. Um, but before I talk a bit more about the actual, uh, the actual project and some of the, the research that I've undertaken and, and uh, the findings that, I, that, that, um, that, that resulted, a bit about uh, just some basic stuff really around, around what, the, what the law says. So you may have encountered these provisions already, but under the Children Act, uh, 
It's possible that under 18s may be supervised by local authorities and removed from the care of their parents through care and supervision orders um, if there is judged to be a significant risk of harm to the child or to children. And harm in this context means ill treatment or the impairment of health or development, including impairment suffered from seeing or hearing the ill treatment of another. So in the case law, we find that harm has been found to encompass, for example, uh, witnessing the domestic abuse of a parent, uh, not attending school, uh, not receiving adequate medical treatment, and also the use of substances in the home. That said, there are some correctives, and I'll talk a bit more about the domestic context, but there are some correctives to that. So uh, the, the European Court of Human Rights ruling is that taking children into care should generally be a last resort and only temporary in order to preserve the rights of both parents and children to respect for family life. And judges in family courts um, and lawyers actually are often in a really difficult position because, you know, the, the best place for a child is normally with their parents and to stay with their family. Um, outcomes for children who go into care are generally not as good um, as for children who are uh, able to reside in the same in their own in their family home uh, from the, with the parents or parent who raised them. Uh, so it's obviously very difficult for judges to make that decision to kind of pull children away from that environment um, from parents who they love. Uh, because there's some evidence of some problem happening within that family um, environment and substance use is often, um, like I said, cited as a reason um, for that to be necessary. And as I said, in private law cases as well, evidence of parental drug or alcohol use is often used um, by one party against the other and also may preclude the use of mediation services following family breakdown. So it's a really important, um, really important issue uh, and as I said, um, there hasn't been a huge amount of, of research done into it and questions where research has been done, uh, the questions relating to parental substance misuse have mainly been tackled by researchers operating within the fields of uh, social work, public health and so on. So what I wanted to do with my research, and I've published a couple of papers on this now, and I'm, I'm also in receipt of a small grant to, to take that research further and to, and to do some interviews with, with lawyers, barristers, solicitors, and also magistrates and judges, um, was to think a bit more about how substances are framed within family court judgments. Um, and my, I suppose my, my, my kind of way of which I wanted to approach this question was to think about how parental drug use is problematized. What I was thinking was, well, you know, judges are making these really important decisions. Social workers are often providing expert evidence within court cases, um, whether in person or filing uh, reports. But is there a consistency about what, how drug and drugs and addiction affect parental capacity? If there isn't consistency, why? What do we judge um, consistency to be? Um, so those are all really important questions in relation to, to the research. But what I wanted to do as a sort of first tranche of research, if you like, was I went into uh, uh, Westlaw, as you m might or hopefully will do at some point over the course of your studies, uh, to, uh, to basically source uh, all the cases, all the reported cases that I could find where parental substance use and addiction was, was mentioned. And that totaled 178 cases. Now that doesn't sound like many, but bear in mind that these are only reported cases. So there was that to be something significant enough about these cases for them to have been reported in some kind of journal or another. Uh, and my, my analysis was informed um, by this sort of what we call a problematization perspective or, or a theoretical pro approach in which I wanted to really critique exactly um, what was meant by drug use and addiction. And this is sort of informed by quite a lot of literature in the non-legal field, drug studies, health studies and so on, that, that has really explored drugs and addiction as not these sort of stable objective terms that we might come to think of them as. But actually, drugs and addiction are often sort of made or produced differently depending on, on the context in which they're talking about. So in other words, they're not, they're not these stable characteristics and they can change and that actually that can have a really important effect on the outcome for, for, for example, people who are using drugs um, or indeed children as well. So 
I should say that I didn't want to criticise the judgments. Like I said, the judges and the magistrates involved often have these really difficult cases before them. Um, and I also don't want to suggest that children are not harmed by the use of, of substances within by parents or within families or addiction. Um, but, I, I, but I wanted to look more at, at how terms like drugs addiction and parenting are framed and, and what the relationship was between them, really. So the first, the first question I wanted to sort of uh, to think about was, you know, what is exactly the risk to children? And also, what does case law say about what the effect of drugs and alcohol use, abuse, uh, however it's termed, and it's and the use of terms is also contentious and problematic. Um, how does that affect outcomes? So Lady Hale um, has, has taken or took a fairly kind of immediate um, Amb not ambiguous, but fairly kind of um, uh, level view. And and her, uh, her, she said, we're all frail human beings with our fair share of unattractive character traits, um, bad behaviours and so on, and that this might include um, the abuse of alcohol or drugs. And basically that's not an, a big enough reason in and of itself to remove children from a family environment and to be looked after by the state. There isn't necessarily a lot of consistency in this respect though so um, uh, this is a slightly older case uh, but in this case Lord Justice Thorpe said um, in his experience sitting on the bench um, 11 years as a judge of the family division um, his view was that parents who deal in drugs or dabble in drugs or even take drugs have great difficulty retaining care of their children so not even abuse of drugs in how Lady Hale talked about it but just dabbling in drugs just evidence of having taken some drugs that that's going to be a, a real problem for retaining the care of their children now this this case is as you can see it's about 10 10 10 or 15 years old um, so the, the situation might have changed in family courts and we also have now problem solving courts so family drug and alcohol courts unfortunately it looks like those are going to be discontinued but it will vary from court to court as, to, as I'm, I, I imagine as, as to you know I'm from judge to, to judge as to you know to what extent um, drugs uh, results in, in, in these sorts of outcomes and I suppose that's that's the reason why I wanted to study it really it didn't seem to be a clear kind of a clear perspective or a clear um, precedent for precisely how it's going to affect cases for either in public law or private law. So one of the things I was interested in looking at, um, and I'll just outline um, three here, um, there'll be, um, I want to talk a bit about how drugs are produced, um, how addiction is produced, that's to say you know, how is it framed in the decisions? I'll also look a bit about the gendered nature of problematic use. And I'll also look at, um, or tell you a bit about <clears throat> another finding which, which pointed towards how drugs are often isolated as the cause for family breakdown, when, you know, there might have been other contextual factors at play. Uh, and I'll talk about those things as we go along. Um, the, the, a, bit, a bit more context, the general um, sense you get, or I got from reading the cases, was that you know drug use was considered to be immoral, it was frowned upon, um, it was considered to be a failure of personal responsibility. You might not be surprised as lawyers to, to notice or to find out that uh, courts are more likely to see, to, to kind of frame this in terms of responsibilities, considering responsibility is so important to, to, uh, to law and legal logic. Uh, but judges talked about things like uh, drug taking was like catching a disease, um, uh, drug use was framed as threatening and infectious, drug abuse would be more higher than learning difficulties of the parents in terms of uh, personal character defects. Um, and, um, you know, it wasn't just about the risk posed by taking drugs, it was also being involved in the drug culture as well. So that's just a bit of a flavour of, of some of the general kind of like um, comments that, that, that judges tended to make in the transcripts about, about the use of drugs. It wasn't condoned, put it that way. Um, in terms of then how drugs were framed and uh, how addiction was framed, uh, there wasn't consistency in which substances were and were not problematic, nor in how much use was problematic. Uh, 
uh, across the cases. So judges said different things. So in this case, I've highlighted it because um, caffeine was, was considered to be a drug of abuse and the father involved was thought to be abusing, abusing caffeine along with various other drugs. Uh, and you can tell in this quote, I won't read it out to you because I'm sure you're capable of reading, uh, that caffeine was um, you know, alongside other drugs, almost as if it was equal to other drugs. Um, in some cases, excessive use of prescribed uh, drugs were also problematic. So benzodiazepines, sleeping pills, um, they were thought to impede good parenting, although it wasn't always clear what excessive use of those drugs meant. Quite a lot of people use um, benzos, as they're called, on a, on a daily basis. Quite a lot of people use alcohol on a daily basis. It wasn't entirely clear the extent to which that became problematic. Um, it, it, there was also a, a difference of opinion about whether people who are on maintenance therapy, that's to say they are taking drugs, prescribed medicine in order to come off, say, heroin, um, whether that would impede parental capacity either. So there was a lack of consistency really about drug effects and it depended on the case as to where, what kind of substances inhibited parental capacity. And as you can imagine, I think that's a, parent, a potential problem in terms of consistency and fairness of outcomes. And, and, and you know, uh, th there might be a dependency on the moral views of the judge as to, you know, whether a the use of a particular substance was or was not problematic. Another takeaway, uh, important takeaway, I thought, was the ways in which drugs were blamed for family breakdown and family problems. So what you sometimes found is a discussion, quite a lengthy discussion in the transcripts of all sorts of problems that had affected these particular families. So perhaps the parent, one or both of the parents had experienced some kind of abuse as children. Perhaps they were then behaving problematically when they were older um, because by using drugs and alcohol, perhaps dealing in drugs and alcohol. Uh, but there was often some background to it and often some contextual factor, fa factors. You know, it wasn't middle class people who suddenly started using drugs and having problems with drugs and alcohol, um, but, you know, perfectly kind of uh, well-adjusted middle-class people who hadn't had many much trauma in their background. It was almost always, um, you know, unfortunate cases really of people who'd experienced disadvantage and were now using drugs and alcohol. But what was interesting, I thought, was how judges tended to nevertheless uh, isolate drugs as the causal, the causal factor that was leading to family breakdown. So in this case, the judge said that all four children have experienced a chronically unstable, chaotic and unsafe home environment due to their mother's drug, use, drug misuse and the accompanying issues of neglect of their basic needs and poor emotional achievement. And in this case, the mother had experienced all sorts of, of, of child abuse, sexual abuse. She'd been raped in the past, but it was it was due to the mother's drug misuse. That was the problem. And um, I just thought that was quite interesting because, uh, you know, most evidence and in fact, as is said in other cases, it's it's usually kind of a, a, a number of factors that cause, you know, that, that lead to the children being neglected and leading to problems with, with children's upbringing, not, not simply uh, usually to do with the drug misuse, although I'm not discounting the possibility, of course, that drug use, drug misuse is, um, does cause enormous problems um, depending on the drugs and how much it's used. So harm wasn't consistently really taught, you know, there wasn't a consistent way in which harm was thought to, to, to kind of be experienced. And the final takeaway um, that, that I thought you might be interested in thinking about was, was how the judgments were gendered. Uh, and, and, and a bit of background to this. So <clears throat> although research on female substance use remains relatively limited, um, women consumers do tend to be portrayed as doubly deviant and more disturbed than their male counterparts. Um, and this is, is not uh, probably not surprising to any of you who've, who've studied feminist critiques of the law, whether it's the criminal law or family law. Um, but, but women who basically are thought to behave in a deviant manner, they're not only um, deviant because of that behaviour, but also because of their trans transgression of traditional gender roles. It is not ladylike or it is not womanlike somehow to take drugs. Plus, there is also the moral opprobrium associated with taking drugs in the first place. So good mothers don't really use substances and those that do are portrayed as negligent and unfit. 
A good mother is generally thought to be thoughtful, altruistic, patient, devoted to her children. Um, you know, she sets her own goals and interests aside. She devotes herself to entirely to her children. She sacrifices her own happiness and well-being for her children. Uh, that's that's a kind of a lot of literature that's kind of remarked on how how that's generally how women are represented and how mothers are represented in the social sphere. Uh, and women's drug addiction has has consistently been framed within this domain of social reproduction. So it's not just that they're addicted, it's that they are somehow failing to ensure the correct bio social and development uh, survival of their children or development of their children. And this was replicated really in the cases. So although there were, there were uh, often cases where there was um, drug use by both the father and the mother, it was often the mother's behaviour and the mother's drug use that was remarked upon as being particularly problematic. So in this case, the father was identified as a user of crack cocaine and possibly heroin, but the judge only commented on the mother's plight and said it was truly pitiful and seemingly particularly ill-befitting of a mother and woman. So although the father was thought to be self-centred, controlling and over-assertive, it was actually the greatest damage to the mother's um, chances of caring for her children was through her long-standing addiction to drugs and drink. It wasn't, you know, there wasn't a mention so much of the behaviour of the father, although he was described as being, you know, having a, uh, a sort of uh, antisocial personality. Nevertheless, it wasn't seen as particularly kind of disturbing in the same way that it was for the mother in this case, or as important to the outcome. And the um, judicial constructions of, of the sort of the life narratives of the women, um, they also tended to draw on either bad choices and deviant behaviours or tragic histories of the women who had been caught up in cycles of deprivation and abuse. Um, and, and yet, you know, it was still the drug use that was normally cited as being the problem, the, the key uh, problem that was causing her to lose um, custody, residence, contact with the children and the permission to mother was generally contingent on abstinence from drugs. So um, I hope you found that interesting um, I, I suppose there's a few things that you might want to take away from it. Um, hopefully you, you found it interesting anyway but um, I suppose what, what, what I found was that the focus on individual responsibility and parental responsibility fitted quite well with the ways in which um, socially excluded mothering practices have been subject to particular scrutiny in market-based societies um, and, and in that sense parents are often seen as primarily responsible for all sorts of deficits and problems that are said to arrive rise in families and in society and this is often to the exclusion of structural variables such as poverty and class so it's, in to some extent it's not really surprising you know drugs is an easy way to say look this is the problem it's much easier to say this is a failure of personal responsibility than to get into all of the um, circumstances of inequality and how to resolve those problems of inequality um, and, and we do know that by the way that drug problems are much more kind of concentrated in deprived areas they tend to coagulate there it's not that middle class uh, people don't use drugs it's just that drug problems people in camp developing problems tends to occur, be more likely to occur in more deprived communities um, uh, and so yeah t substance use was, was, was tended to be identified as causally responsible for the family problems and um, and even for for uh, child harm uh, and there was less kind of uh, mention of the importance of things like social support particularly from fathers uh, financial problems mental health issues um, or domestic violence even and also pointed out that the relationship between substance use and motherhood was constructed as as, as uh, especially problematic. Uh, and this is this is troubling um, in terms of, I suppose, how we understand and view gender relations and, and particularly the ways in which we hold women more responsible for failing to conform to the ideals of a maternal and uh, parental role. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Please, please feel free to get in touch with me if you've got any questions. And uh, thanks again.